Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. This is Alex, and I'm coming to you from California. And we've got people, particularly a great number of people today, because it's a it's a special night. It's one of the processing workshops that we're going to be doing. So uh, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. And um, before we go any further and have our regular show, we are very pleased tonight to have Ken Crawford with us. Ken Crawford is in charge of the Astro Imaging Channel. No, he's not. He's in charge of the Advanced Imaging Conference. And uh, the Advanced Imaging Conference is coming up in, um, in November. And he is going to tell us a little bit about it. Ken, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. OK, take it away. Thanks so much, Alex. Hey, I appreciate it very much. And uh, hello to all the astrophotographers out there. I'm excited to be here with you tonight. Um, thank you, Alex, for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to hear that you guys do these um, image processing uh, gatherings. Um, those of us at the Advanced Imaging Conference, we listen to um, everybody's surveys. And the number one thing people see, seem to have the most issue with is actually the uh, image processing. But I, I, I have, I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the Advanced Imaging Conference. We were started in 2004. There was a small group of us. I was one of the original founders along with Steve Mandel and Don Goldman, which you may have heard of um, from uh, some of the best uh, filters out there. Um, and now it has become the, actually the largest gathering of astro imagers um, in the world. Uh, and we used to be every year, but in 2015 decided to go to every other year, mainly because of A, the workload, but B, um, to make sure there's enough fresh new things um, that we could talk about and make happen. So uh, 2017 was the last one, and uh, we have 2019 coming up. We have a very um, unique mission, I feel, and it's really to nurture and gather, disseminate information about producing high quality images and really to help, you know, push the general public awareness and appreciation of these non-professionally produced pictures. And that's really our, our goal and our, and our function. Um, we have basically a board of directors and um, you can see there, uh, there's, some, there's some prominent names in the imaging community and we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we're a non-compensated board of directors. We do this for the love of like what you guys are doing um, after this, um, talking about you know, how, to, how to further enjoy this crazy hobby that we're in um, that takes so much of our effort and our time um, and we wanna make it more rewarding. So one of the things that happened back in 2006 is we decided to come up with an award that um, for those people who really were significant in the, the, not only the production of great images, but also how they reached out and helped others, popularization, public outreach, um, and also support for uh, even scientific endeavors. And, the Hubble Award is what kind of started. Uh, this year, uh, Jay Gabani is our Hubble Award winner and will be doing the Hubble um, uh, lecture uh, at AIC. Um, there's a kind of a list of everybody that was been, has been awarded this uh, prestigious award. You may recognize some of the people on there. I just want to go over a little bit. It's all about the agenda, right? So AIC, we like to say, hey, it's kind of like a fire hose that we kind of uh, push out everybody. Um, Friday is one of our biggest days. We have actually have um, 20 different uh, things going on at once. And what we have is workshops. And we decided uh, one of the best things that's happened is we break these up into different categories. Um, everything from um, processing, of course, that's the one of the core items that everybody is really interested in. Um, and we've broken those down into beginner to intermediate, all the way through advanced topics. Um, and then image acquisition, which will include um, equipment, 
setting up equipment, everything from, you know, getting started, you know, choosing the right equipment all the way to one of the big themes we're having is image automation. And we'll be um, showcasing the three major image auto automation uh, software systems out there, um, either, either by the people who actually um, wrote the software or are super, what we call super users that are very, very high level. When we, when we look at uh, workshops and presentations, we work very hard at not only finding people who are good at what they do, but they can also present on a professional level and be able to um, really uh, lay out on a step-by-step -step basis how they feel they, uh, is the best way to go. Um, we also have a planetary. We've got Chris, Christopher Go coming in and um, Tuan, where uh, you know, we're using regular wide field cameras to produce these beautiful skyscapes. And uh, we're bringing uh, Carrie Ann um, Hepburn in, and, uh, and she's very good at that. So as you can see, um, Friday is, is quite full. And uh, you also notice that it, what we've seen through the years back in, you know, from 2004 on is that it's kind of split in the two major groups as far as processing methods. Of course, um, Pix Insight has really roared to the, the, the forefront. Uh, but there's still some of us like us, uh, myself, who's, who thinks in layers and uh, um, CCD stack and Photoshop and, and that type of thing um, is still, still shown in, in how, to, you know, how to better improve the image quality. Um, Friday night, uh, we, we have quite a few sponsors, so we give them five minutes uh, to show some of their, their new uh, New, new products or new systems and that type of thing. So we have little little uh, videos that they, we allow them to do. And uh, we bring in some of the newer stuff out there. And uh, we, we'll end the night at uh, not nine o'clock. So I can tell you that it's very full and you're gonna be tired at the end of it. Saturday is another great day. Um, we start out in general session, uh, we'll have, uh, Jacob Annie's uh, Hubble Award lecture. And um, we brought in one of the better um, engineers out there has been working with CCD cameras and cameras in general for a long time from FLI. And he's gonna be speaking about the CMOS systems. Um, Dr. Ann is uh, gonna be giving a Pro-Am collaboration talk. Um, we've always hoped that the advanced imaging conference can be, become a conduit for pro-am collaboration. Uh, some of us have done that in the past, star streams or, you know, other types of things. And um, we're, we're bringing her in and, and she's very good. She's going to be very, very exciting, interesting talk about uh, something that we can actually, uh, those of us who are interested, help out. Um, and then, we have some more, well, then we'll break after lunch back into more of a workshop theme. And uh, we have everything from, again, uh, uh, all types of image processing, using Photoshop, uh, new imaging tech, you know, some of the new things that they're using all the way from Raspberry Pis to other goodies. And Dr. Gaston has a very unique system um, using some amazing stuff on how to you know, use collimation um, with a, a unique system I don't think anyone's seen before. And then that night, we're gonna have a very uh, special dinner, big gala, um, where we can all network and have a good time. And uh, we, I guess in 2017, uh, the problem, we had a problem and we, of course, we, we analyzed very carefully after these things and we found out that the heavy hors d'oeuvres didn't cut it. And uh, we, we promise no one will go hungry on a Saturday night. And of course, our exhibit hall is open uh, at, at time too. Sunday, our last day is a half day, and we, we have uh, more workshops. And the big deal is, of course, the door prizes. We give away you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of goodies. And the big rule is you must be present to win. Now, you know, one of the problems that we have is uh, 
this is, we know we're giving you a fire hose of information at AIC. So one of the things what we do is we videotape each one of these. And part of the registration fee gets you instant access to these workshops, including previous year workshops. We've, we've recently loaded everything from, let's say, 2012, 13, for some reason, 14 isn't in there yet, but we definitely have 15, 17, um, where you can go back to your heart's content and look over um, what you might have missed. Uh, so no need to furiously take notes. Every moment you will be able to go back and uh, look through these things. The exhibit hall is a big function of what we have also. This year we sold out very quickly um, all of our space for the uh, exhibit hall. And uh, we're proud to have uh, these sponsors and, and to be a sponsor, um, this level of sponsorship is, is, is a big uh, chunk of money for these folks. So we do everything we can to make sure that you get plenty of time, face time with your uh, vendors. You know, really nowhere else can you get that's strictly limited to the imaging side of life. These are our uh, sponsors and these are our vendors. So between the two uh, groups here, um, you will be you'll get to see everything new and great. Um, if you go to the website, you see those gold stars. Um, they, they will be populating more and more of those. Those will be show specials or something special they'll be trying to uh, demonstrate or show at, at uh, AIC. And again, the Saturday Night Gala, that's going to be a big event. Um, and we really hope to see, if you are at all uh, love astrophotography, you really need to come to AIC. I mean, it's a it's a special event, um, and it's it's just such a nice thing to get to see people in person, get to talk to the vendors, um, get all this information, and have a great time. Just letting you know, registration fee is three hundred and forty dollars at this point. Um, we. One of the tough things is that we've worked real hard about getting a block of rooms at basically $149 per night at the San Jose Hilton, uh, which is connected right to the uh, San Jose Convention Center. That place goes for an average of $350 to $400 a night and, and prime time, and uh, we've done a good job, and we're running out of space. We don't have a whole lot left, so please, if you're thinking about coming and staying, um, that's the way to go. Part of this is you'll get, uh, of course, uh, your, digi your AIC digital library card, which again, allows you the unrestricted download of the presentations and video recordings. Um, so you, you, you won't miss a thing. So if you want to go learn more about it, please go to our advancedimagingconference.com website um, if if you're interested, about every two weeks we put out a little email broadcast. It's a it's a news alert for the Advanced Imaging Conference. To subscribe to that, um, it's at the bottom of the of the home page. Got a little uh, click on news updates. Fill in your information. You can um, withdraw from that anytime you like. Also, um, if you've already registered or if you were there in 2017, you're already on the list. You've probably been getting the email alerts. If you haven't, please go in and, and uh, you know, update. One last thing, you know, those of us have been involved with the Amingshire Conference for a long time. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. And we're looking for more help. So we want to put the word out that uh, anybody who's decent at marketing, that means, hey, you're good at Facebook, um, you can write. Uh, I'd like to do, you know, I'm, I'm not real fond at doing so, uh, you know, writing the news alerts and that kind of thing. I'm not that great at it. So we'd love to find someone that can take that over. Um, Chris Murray has been an excellent as, as our CFO, um, but it'd be nice to have some bookkeeping um, you know, data entry, that kind of thing. And a lot of that happens really the year before. 
Um, and of course, if you're good at event planning or project management, um, we, we would love to hear from you. Remember that we've gone to every uh, two years. And uh, so the next one won't be until 2021. So we would really, I'd like to personally invite all of you if you're interested or love astrophotography, it's, you, you won't be disappointed. We give a lot for the amount of money you spend. We'd love to see you there. And anyway, um, I don't know if there are, are there any, uh, Alex, are there any questions? If there are any questions about the advanced um, imaging conference? Let me look, so I'm just looking yeah. through um, Rumble Talk and no, pretty much everybody's gone over to the YouTube comment section. Um, Toga or Eric, have you been monitoring YouTube? Uh, there's nothing I see on, uh, on okay, YouTube. No specific Alex. questions then. Okay, cool. All now, right. It's still possible to register for that. And if you're yes. in the San Jose area, you don't actually need to stay at the hotel or anything, right? That's correct. Um, you know, we, we did, the reason San Jose is, we just basically through the years have outgrown all the other venues and mm -hmm. it's close to an airport. Um, there's quite a few other uh, hotels in the area. Um, and if you can do something better, you know, have at it or stay with a friend or whatever, but no, that's, it's not required that you, uh, that you stay at the hotel. Okay. Um, good. Um, you, uh, then um, I think we want to thank you a lot for um, for being here with us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to being up in San Jose. I do want to make a general announcement to everybody that um, that AIC uh, is the is AIC. TAIC is completely different. It just so happens that we've got um initials that are very similar uh we don't even use the same words to get to those initials advanced imaging conference started a long time before adam came up with an idea of having a youtube channel called the astro imaging channel um there are i, I sometimes make goofy mistakes but that's because i'm me and i make goofy mistakes but some of you i know that uh, i mean there was a comment last week something about the aic people well no we aren't the aic people ken and his crew are the aic people okay we're taic so don't want to get too picky on that but that's an important well, we, pre to make. we appreciate that and i do look forward to seeing you alex um and and thank you for your leadership and uh you know, helping all these folks out with uh, with what you do. Thanks so much. It's fun to do. And we're going to do a lot of it tonight. Thank you, Ken, for being here. Okay, I know you got to go. You got to go. You got to go. Do what you got to do. But uh, thank you for being here so far. Thanks, Ken. I'm going. Uh, just, I, I have one question. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, for Ken. The registration okay. is open, right, Ken? Yeah, yes, registration, registration is open. open. Um, we've even registered people at the uh, door before. Um, we have that, but the, here's here's the here's the honest truth. What sometime about three to four weeks before the conference, um, our costs go up. So everything that we do and add to, they, they we get charged. You know, it, this is a bunch of union based. You can imagine all the things. So so the cost will be a little bit higher. Um, if you come to the door or to, somewhere around three or four weeks before uh, the conference. So if all possible, please, you know, register uh, before then, because we, we, we want to give you as much value as you can for the buck. We understand it's a lot of money, but our goal is it, the value is way bigger than the pile of bucks. And, and I want to add also, you don't actually need a rubber stamp on your butt certifying you as an advanced imager to be there. <laughs> you know, okay. that, that's a, that's a really great question because when we sat around, uh, when originally advanced imaging conference had to be basically, how do we get some people together around the table and talk about how they do stuff? Um, and when Steve Mandel came up with, he wanted something to say, Hey, this is advanced image. In other words, this wasn't rank beginner. But through the years, we started catering more and more. Yeah, we'll, we'll take beginners. We'll take uh, anyone who wants to learn. That's why we have a track for people that's just getting started and that type of thing. So hopefully, um, you know, you don't get scared off by the name. That's kind of why we say a lot of AIC, to be honest. Hmm. Okay. Anyway. 
Thanks, Kent, for being here. Thanks and now so we return to our regular programming. And I will go to sharing my screen, my entire screen, and sharing it. And um, OK. I want to go where, where, which of my screens do I want to share? That one, I think. And I remind everybody that um, we are on the Astro Imaging channel. And when you go to the main part of the program here and you click here, you can um, see that there is an area to make comments. Click on this little green and white box and you will find a place to make all your comments and you can, you can type things in and we'll try to get to it and answer your questions. But I got to give you a piece of advice here, and that is that um, um, not many people use that anymore. It turns out that we're, we've been sh sh kind of shuffling people over to the, um, to the uh, uh, YouTube comments themselves. So let me get out of here. And as you are um, actually showing this, that's the screen I was talking about. If you click down here, you can go straight to the YouTube uh, channel where we're also broadcasting all this. And when you get over there, if this works the way it's supposed to, and it's not. Anyway, you can make a full set of comments over there. Uh, and so please go over and do that. You can also make donations to the program if you like. Nobody's asking you to for sure to. We appreciate John making one tonight. Um, I know I noticed that one already. Uh, let's look at the upcoming shows first. And uh, are, are we, we catching, catching up there? Let me see. What's... Are we okay, uh, Tolga? Right, right now, now we, we should, should be look looking at the upcoming screen. screen. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Good. Um, tonight is the uh, Astro Imaging uh, Channel contrib contributors. We're doing the processing workshop. Next week, Terry Hancock's going to be here telling us about Grand Mesa Observatory. And the week after that, Hamza's coming back with his third uh, presentation about the software that he uses. This September 8th, it says we're going to have another processing workshop. I think we're not going to have another processing workshop. Uh, I think we need to space out our workshops a little bit more. And so well, we're going to be putting off that workshop for a while. We don't yet have a presenter for that, but we'll be getting somebody. And then we've got uh, September 22nd. Greg can't be here for that. So we have to also fill that one in. And, you know, it's funny listening to um, what Ken was talking about just now um, that uh, we just had Carrie um, uh, from um, uh the, Carrie was on, and she's going to be at, at AIC. Um, we just had Richard Wright on. He's going to be a presenter at AIC. I think I saw Terry Hancock's name there. He's going to be here next week with us. So we'll have a number of people. Uh, you, you are getting advanced imagers coming to present here on the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, tonight, though, we're going to be talking about a workshop. And the workshops, I want to just tell you that in order to get this data, you just go click on workshop, obviously. And then this is the data that we're going to be talking about today. If you click there, you'll go to a box and be able to download the data. And you'll still be able to download that data. This this page will remain here. We won't be accepting um, pictures anymore, but we will continue to uh, leave the page there and you can process the data if you like. Also, you can go back to the previous two workshops we did with Eric's and Terry's data and process them. And uh, you can see that they're, they're still there. You can go back and see what they've offered. There are a number of people who made, um, uh, who gave us work to to do um, and and examples of it. It's always amazed me how the same piece of data can get so many different interpretations. And um, here's one from yours truly. By the way, I after seeing what the other people did, I went back and changed mine, but I didn't upload anything new. Um, this is um, this is from Mike, uh, uh, Michael. And uh, this one here is that's me again. Now, where are we up to here? Where is the one I'm looking for? That one right there. Oh, that's Linda. Linda's going to be talking first tonight. But uh, one of them was from uh, Eric, and I'm not going to. Uh, is that Eric's? Um, what Eric was particularly proud. This is John's. What Eric was particularly proud of was the fact that that he managed to process his in only about 25 minutes. 
just using his AstroArt. No, I'll look at that. Uh, but rather than spend any more time doing that, um, we're ready to go. And Linda, you're going to be up first. So um, are you ready to go? Sure thing, Alex. I'm ready. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Alex, for the invitation on tonight. Um, they were talking about the uh, uh, advanced imaging conference, and I'm the furthest thing from an advanced imager. I've been doing this about a year and a half now, and with the terrible weather that we have here in uh, Northern Virginia in 2018 in particular, it was uh, it was tough to get any sky time, and all of this year has been a little bit kinder. Um, so I think globular clusters are some of the hardest things in the world to uh, to process. You've basically got a bunch of dots. And so my goal when I processed this was basically to try to make it look as much like it looks in the eyepiece to me, but with the color that you know our eyes typically don't pick up. And so my, my goal was to get the kind of detail that you could get in a nice telescope along with the color and, and try to you know, preserve as much of that dynamic range as my meager skills would allow. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll step through um, the history of what I did here. And if we go back to the luminance, here's where we started. And so the first thing I did was the decision on, on what to crop. And the way Alex had framed this originally, you know, the, the uh, M13 was off center and there was this interesting galaxy in the upper right hand corner. And my first thought was that framing was really kind of awkward. You know, you're kind of splitting your, your attention between two different things, but I also thought that it was still better to have it there than to not have it there. So I decided to preserve that galaxy, even though my first inclination was to cut it out. And so I ended up just doing a fairly minimal crop and then ran uh, dynamic background extraction here. And the next thing I wanted to do was uh, deconvolution. And let me uh, zoom in here a little bit closer. And so when I ran deconvolution, it, it tightened things up just a little bit. And these were the settings that I used for deconvolution. And hopefully that makes things a little bit more readable. So there's a, a a mask that I had created as a local support image, and I'll, I'll bring that up here in a second. Um, and that's basically just a, a clone of the luminance image stretched to, uh, to darken the background and bring out the stars. So that's... Uh, Go back here. So the next thing we did was, uh, our next thing I did was a little bit of um, noise reduction on the luminance channel. And here were my settings. So it, it's pretty mild uh, noise reduction. And let's uh, zoom back in here. Again, I use that same mask image to uh, uh, protect the stars. And you can see we just just uh, did a little bit of noise reduction. So the next step was to do a nonlinear transformation, which was just a, a basic histogram transformation. And let's uh, turn the auto stretch back on. And um, this is what I ended up with. And then the last thing I did was an RGB working space to set all the channels to be the same. 
this is one of those steps where I've read that it's important to do before LRGB combination, although I do not fully understand the reason why. Um, so that's what we have for the luminance part of the equation. Uh, here is actually the final image. Let's come over here to, if I can find it, RGB. So again, we have our initial state and uh, we have the same DBE. Um, oh, I cropped the, uh, the uh, RG and B masters before combining them. So that's why you don't see that here. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was photometric color calibration. But to do that, I needed the image scale, which I didn't have. And so I sent the image up to astrometry.net to determine the image scale. And then since I'm imaging with a 480 millimeter refractor, just picked an image size here to give me that, that scale that we needed. And then it would plate solve. Um, so let me uh, back up here to, there's what the image looked like after uh, DBE. And there's what we looked like after photometric color calibration, so not a, a big difference. So the next thing I did, let me zoom in here again, was run chrominance and luminance noise reduction. So there was some luminance noise reduction there. And that was with the same luminance settings before. And then a little bit stronger noise reduction for chrominance. And those were the, the settings for that. And uh, then I just uh, changed the uh, image identifier to be RGB so that I would, in the, the bunches of windows that I happen to have open, um, be able to keep track of what was going on. So my next step was to do a nonlinear stretch here. And since color was important for me in this image, um, I decided to use the arc sine H stretch. And I did that, um, which, you know, looks pretty dark, but I knew that when I combined it with the luminance, that it was going to uh, lighten the image up a fair amount. So again, the same RGB working space to, to make the, uh, the channel, uh, channels all equal balance. And then just a, a stock standard combine the luminance with the uh, with the RGB, which did lighten it up a little bit. And then the last thing I did was another multi-scale linear transformation, but this time to do some some very, very minor sharpening. Um, I, the one thing I didn't want to happen was to create a bunch of uh, uh, little rings around the stars, which a lot of sharpening does. And so when I did that, I'm not sure if you could see the difference there. There's before the sharpening and there's after the sharpening, which just tightened things up just a little bit. And so I wanted to, to, to keep as much detail as I would toward, toward the core. Uh, you can see the propeller here. Um, kind of just beginning to come out. And, and just by coincidence, um, I had actually imaged M13 in my much smaller refractor. And by comparison, um, let me see if I actually have the, uh, the final image there. And so, you know, there's the difference between seeing it in a much smaller telescope 
compared to to Alex's. Alex Alex was able to hold a lot more detail in the center than than my little telescope could. So that's what I have, Alex. Um, if there are no questions, I'll turn it back to you. And if there are questions, I'll do my best to to try and answer them. Okay, thank you. I've lost track of Rumble Talk. Well, how are you guys doing over in um, YouTube? I don't see any questions, but I do have a comment for Linda. Sure. If when you do your LRGB combination, when you're using the luminance, there is a very effective chrominance noise reduction, which mm -hmm. kind of eliminates, if you just check that box, it'll eliminate the need to do uh, chrominance noise reduction. Okay, thank you. Or you. In fact, I was watching when you went to the LRGB and you hadn't done the checkbox. Do that. It, it's actually more effective than uh, I think doing it separately, at least in my hands. Okay, I, I will bear that in mind for the future. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Linda. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for, for putting stuff in and, and contributing. We're gonna go over to Ryan next. Ryan, can you unmute yourself and join us? Yep, I'm here. And thanks again for letting me present. Let me share my screen real quick. So, Okay, and let me get the slideshow going. All right, so thanks, Alex, for providing the data. This would be the first time I ever processed any type of monochrome data. I'm a DSLR imager uh, for now, but I have been looking at uh, possibly getting a monochrome camera later on. So I wanted to try it out and see what I could do. And I had previously captured M13 like Linda had uh, with my DSLR, and that's the image in the lower right. So I'd be, I was curious to see the comparison at the end. And the sources that I've used for uh, the processing of this, since I didn't know anything, was Life Vortex Astronomy as well as Inside Pix Insight by uh, Warren Keller. Uh, so the first step was to load the, R, the files, obviously. And then uh, this is where I differ from Linda, is I didn't crop anything at the beginning. I went straight into the channel combination and combined the three channels to get me as close to the DSLR type uh, image as I could. And this is where we ended up. Uh, when I auto stretched it, had a huge blue cast to it. Uh, I cropped out the edges where the uh, the, the combination uh, left a little bit of artifacts in the corners. Uh, I did try to keep the galaxy and the two brighter stars in play. And then from this point on, I treated it just like I would uh, any image I produced from my DSLR. Uh, then I've used DBE to remove that blue cast, and the, the downside to that was it brought forward that back column. Then I went into, since I didn't have the data and I didn't even think about using uh, blind solve to get the, the scale, uh, I went ahead and just went with background ne neutralization and color calibration. And then I did not do any SCNR um, since the uh, there's no bare matrix like my DSLR has. So there wasn't a green cast to worry about. And then I used the RGB working space to equalize the channels. Then I went and used the multi-scale linear transform to apply noise reduction and sharpening. And I completely spaced and did not crop the luminance image earlier on. So from that point on, all I could do was really use the synthetic luminance. Uh, and I, sorry, Alex, I didn't use the, the luminance uh, image from this data set. I tried to use deconvolution, but after about an hour, hour and a half, I was getting a lot of worming in the cluster. Uh, so I decided to skip it and uh, not use it. <clears throat> I then used the histogram transformation to stretch the image. And that 
allowed me to get rid of that bad column, but it did darken almost unnaturally the, uh, the background. From that point on, I used range selection to create all my masks and multi-scale linear, or excuse me, HDR multi-scale transform to enhance the contrast, which is, I believe, the purpose of that uh, process. Then I went and did uh, local equalization and I used the curves transformation to bring out a little bit of blue, blue tint as well as uh, tweak the contrast and saturation just a hair. Uh, once again, use range selection for the star mask and morphological transform to shrink the stars. Uh, one thing that I like to do, um, a lot of people I see use the size of five uh, when they're using this. I prefer to use nine. It seems to round out the stars a little bit more. Uh, just a little note for how I do things just a little bit different from other people I've seen. And then comparing my two images, um, I, I like them both, uh, but you know, Alex's data was a shorter focal length than mine. Mine's a 1960 and with a pixel scale of 0.4. And so mine's a little bit of a tighter shot than Alex's was, but in the end, I do like them both. Uh, I just think the uh, backgrounds were a little too dark. And my final thoughts are, I really like the challenge. Um, you know, I, I definitely need to go back and read through Warren Keller's book a little bit more and play around with some more data uh, before I make this leap into monochrome. But the problem I had that I really wasn't too sure how to get was I lost some of the diffraction spike detail uh, that really went away and kind of takes away a little bit, I think. And maybe I could have flipped this uh, image, rotated it, flipped it horizontally, uh, maybe improve the composition a little bit, put the galaxy in the lower right, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't play. I was limited on time. And the, like I said before, the dark the background is just a little dark and unnatural. So uh, with that, I think I'm done. So I will turn it back to Alex for any questions over the next presenter. Okay. Thank you, Ryan, very much. Uh, really appreciated that. Appreciated that you made the effort to do things, and I'm glad that you learned a lot during the process. And that is one of the main reasons that you not only learn a lot but you can kind of demonstrate to everybody else what there is out there uh i think the next person we had in line we were going to go with doug doug you ready uh yep okay take over Okay, uh, let's see, go screen. So can you see me? Yes? You're good on the screen. Okay. We are looking at your PowerPoint presentation. All right. So mine is, uh, I titled it uh, M13 Annotated because I was interested in uh, learning what other little galaxies are hidden in your M13 image. And I'll start what I learned. Um, found out this PIX Insight photometric calibration process creates a header record, which allows for easy annotation. Now, because those TIFF files didn't have the uh, the data for, for the FIT header record, it made it uh, um, difficult initially uh, to do the plate solving, but uh, the photometric calibration process really uh, made everything easy. So there's my uh, my image, which is uh, also plate solved and uh, annotated. Um, so my process, 
basically I registered and uh, cropped uh, the LRGB data, combined the RGB data with the channel combination process and denoised it uh, with multilinear transform, and then calibrated via the photometric calibration process. Luminance deconvolved stretch via mass stretch, and, um, and then everything was combined uh, with the RGB, which had been uh, stretched with arc sine. And that was sort of the, uh, the, uh, the RGB uh, before calibration. Using the photometric calibration, the key there was that there's a function within photometric calibration that even though you don't have the um, coordinates, you can just have it look in the database and find, put M13 in there, and you can find basically the what field you're in. And that allows you to run it. It'll do the white balance. It'll fill in all the header data, which was, which makes uh, the annotation la later uh, much easier. So there is the, the calibrated data, it looks very weak, but, uh, and then there's the, uh, the luminance, uh, but when you combine them, uh, I think it uh, looked very nice. Uh, little galaxies are showing up. Um, and then you go into PixInsight um, using the, under the render scripts, and under that there's annotate. And bang like magic, uh, it takes the coordinate data, which was produced by Photo uh, Calibrate, figures out where it is and annotates. Um, here I've uh, slightly changed the uh, saturation level uh, to make it more colorful. And uh, the big thing um, I found was that this use of this script annotate image to create the annotated image. Um, and I was really happy to realize that photo calibration as two as a twofer, uh, one of the biggest concerns I had was this: well, how much should I adjust the calibration, the color saturation? We go through a lot of effort to calibrate, but then we basically, you know, shift the calibration with our uh, adjustments to make it pretty. So that judgment, uh, I don't know what the right answer is. I also, uh, in the photo calibration process, you know, it goes into the catalogs and uh, identifies all these stars. It'd be nice if that uh, if that would also list those stars, so then you could go into Aladdin or something and and sort of look at the how this spectra differs from those stars, and then maybe that would help us. But I don't know of any way to do that. So anyway, that's uh, that's me. That's I'm done. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much. I'm kind of looking at both the, the comments sections, and we haven't had much in the way of comments all evening, except for a few weather comments and stuff. So I remember that, uh, or I, I remind everybody that um, they're um, over in YouTube. You can make your comments over there, and uh, we do appreciate that. I uh, want to thank you um, for you know, contributing to that. Who are you up? Who's up? John, you up next? John? Uh, yes. Just okay. You take it away. Turning, turning things on. And there's my share screen. And my PowerPoint. And you can see all that. Um, I'm waiting. Waiting it to something. We're on a delay when it comes to real live stuff. Ah. So, but you just go ahead because it'll the delay will catch up to you. Okay. So, um, thank you again for this wonderful data, Alex, and for the two previous sets of data. Um, as I mentioned the last time, uh, I'm a real newbie with Pix Insight. This is about the third or fourth. Um, image I process with Pix Insight, and I learn something new every time. And I learned tonight about a couple of processes that I didn't know previously. Um, so thank you. Uh, this is my finished image, and here's what I liked about it, and what I wanted to uh, get out of it. Um, I'm sorry, John. I, I, are you sharing? 
I thought I was. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Thanks, Linda, for pointing that out. Wow. Go oh, to I may button. have to come. Okay, go to I the may button. have to come back. Okay. Yeah, the button button's about, right there. Okay. You see the three buttons in the upper right? Click on the three buttons. Okay, got it. Take share screen. screen. Yeah. Click on the main screen, which turns the button blue that says share. Yeah, it's Just, not, no, no, click, it's not click. doing that. Where you see where it says your entire screen up there on, on the little pop up? Yeah. It says your entire screen. Okay. Right. Click on the screen right below that. Got it. No, now it's gonna now, it now it's blue, and now there you are. Oh good. Okay, sorry about that. And you can now see my PowerPoint. Yes, we are good. Good. Okay. So here's what I liked. Um I oh let me go back to the final image and I'll show you what I liked. I, I like the sharpness, the detail of the stars in the cluster, and the radiance and coloration of the larger stars. And I had to work hard to get there. And uh, the core uh, was initially pretty burned out, and I had to figure out how to uh, correct that. And I had the background it took me a long time to get it flat and somewhat black. And I wanted to highlight the uh, smaller galaxies, particularly that one up in the upper right-hand corner. So here's how I got there. Um, I started out, of course, by downloading your LRG and B TIFF files. I registered them and aligned them with the star align process. And I should uh, mention, uh, as someone else did, that I'm a big fan of Kron and his um, Light Vortex website, and of course Warren and Inside Pix Inside. I, I used them extensively. The next thing I did was dynamic crop and dynamic background extraction to remove background gradients and uneven borders. And then I did linear fit processing to match up uh, the background and the signal brightness of each of the LR, G, and B images. And then I use channel combination to combine the R, G, and B images and converted them and the luminance image to nonlinear with histogram transformation. And then I added the luminance to the R, G, B image with L, R, G, B combined process. And I'm skipping through that pretty quickly because I think everybody did that at one time or another. Um, and this was my LRGB image, and it needed a lot of work. The uh, cluster core was burned out. The colors were kind of weird and washed out. The background was irregular and noisy, and I did have a green haze in the background. It needed further cropping, and the stars were irregular and not very tight. And so that was what I start what I worked on. So uh, the next thing I did was color calibration with SCNR. And the color got better, but the stars were still irregular. And the background was still noisy and uneven. And the core uh, was still blown out. So I decided to do some processes that were going to uh, require masks. And so the next thing I did was create some masks. I created a clone mask using the latest luminance image, just uh, a clone of that. I created a range mask, and then I created a very aggressive star mask because I was going to use that uh, to adjust star size and shape. I then did multilinear transformation pretty aggressively, not uh, nearly as gently as uh, previously described. And I did, did it twice, and it took care of much of the background noise, but I still found the background irregular, the stars not tight, and the core blown out. So I ran dynamic background extraction 
not once but twice and i was still not happy with the result so i went to uh, warren's book and read about automatic background extraction and used that for the first time and voila uh, much better uh, uh, the background just really smoothed out and uh, uh, looked much better. Then for the final touches and with aggressive masking, um, I used that HDR multi-scale transformation and local histogram equalization to bring out fine detail, um, especially in the cluster's core. And that's how I got rid of much of the uh, blown out central portion of the core. And uh, the next thing I did was uh, morphologic transformation to correct star shape and reduce star size. And I don't remember if it was Doug or Ryan, but I still use the five point star because that's what k -Rot suggests. And my final uh, process was curves transform to enhance the colors the contrast and the saturation. And in the end, I was pretty happy with, uh, with my uh, image. So uh, that's it. I, I know I ran through it quickly, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, unfortunately, there's a tyranny of time. And, and I've, I told all the presenters to, you know, try to emphasize the important things, the things you learned and, you know, what you did different and what you liked and what you didn't like and stuff like that. And you're all doing a pretty darn good job of it. A couple of people have commented on that. Um, the next presenter we've got is El Michael. You ready? Yep, ready. Okay, take it away, Toga. Where do I share the screen? The, the screen sharing, you go up to the... Um, upper right hand corner you see the three dots and a, a vertical dots oh right okay, okay. share okay. screen for those of you who are out there listening in the distance it, it's changed since the first time we've uh, we were doing this when michael was doing this before uh, and then after you after you click that um oh i'm who's who am i on me no me uh are you screen sharing yet you ready to go mike yeah. Yeah. Okay. Start your, your PowerPoint or whatever you're going to do. I'm, yeah, I've just got a bunch of, uh, um, it looks like a tunnel. <laughs> but, uh, oh, okay. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I usually shoot with a one shot color. So this is the, uh, about the fourth time that I used uh, mono data. And, and I just want to thank you for inviting me back. Uh, to do Alex's uh, M13 data. And what I did is I, I took all the images and I, I noticed that uh, there was this column right here. So what I did is I cropped them. I cropped them all the same. And I did a linear fit using the luminance as the reference. And I came up with, uh, oh, well, let's see, after I did the linear fit, I did a D DBE on all of them. And then I, after that, I did a channel combination. And that's when I came up with this image. And it had a, a red cast to it. So I ended up using ABE to get rid of that. And I, to do that, I used subtraction. And, and I, you just drop this on, onto the uh, image. And I got that after I did uh, the combination. And you can tell it's still uh, linear. And uh, after, OK, then I, then I did a histogram transformation on that. And 
And you do that by, uh, you stretch it and, whoop, what do I do here? Uh, what did I do here? I hit a wrong button. Uh, fit to screen. Huh. Let me see here. Okay, there we go. And then I also stretched the uh, the luminance. This is the luminance, and I made that long non-linear also. So that's the non-linear luminance. And let me see here. And this is the non-linear RGB. And I used LRGB combination to combine that M. And that is this one here. And then I ended up using uh, curves. I used curves with a mask to saturate it. And Also, I noticed that there was um, some noise in the background here, so I ended up using uh, ACDNR, and that's that's a great tool to to uh, smooth out the background. Um, and that has a built-in uh, mask, lightness mask that you can use. And what you do is you you can adjust these sliders to protect the the cluster and the galaxy and the star, and then you you can adjust this sh this shadow one here. And when you make the background white, real white like that, that's going to be the area that's going to be uh, uh, have noise reduction reduction applied to it. So. And then from there, uh, I did a, a lightness mask. And if, if, if you make a preview here, you can see what it does here. I'll, I'll make a preview little box around that small galaxy. And you can see what happens when you apply it. I, I don't know if you can see that or not zoomed in, but you can see the, if you look at the background here, you can see the before, you can see how it's kind of, there's a lot of chromium noise in it. And that's after. You can see how it cleans up the background really nice. And I applied that to the image, and I, I came up with this. That's the final. And uh, I purposely I, I like blue stars. I I, I like uh, I like when the when the core of globular clusters are blue like that. And I, I got that just by the saturation. Just increasing the saturation using a I used a range mask to protect everything but the uh, the cluster itself. But that's it. Hey, Michael. Um, thank you very much for that, Michael. Hey, you know what? It, I'm sitting here watching people process my data, and I'm thinking like, oh yeah, I should have done that. Oh yeah, I should have done that. Uh, I don't think there are any new questions over there. You guys are not questiony tonight. What's wrong with y'all? Um, and last, John at Astra. John, you ready? You out there? Can you hear me? Okay, plug yourself in you and me? start sharing your screen and doing whatever you're going to do. Okay, give me a second here. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen and it's got. Um, uh, us and you, you've got to, you know, now start your PowerPoint and everything's fine. Okay. There you go.
or the All right, but I see I use the Pixen site just like everybody else did. So again, my name is John Adastra. Uh, my real name is John Kometz, but I go by John Adastra in the chat room. So you probably see me there. So thanks to Alex for the opportunity and uh, for the data. I've been doing uh, visual astronomy for about 25 years, but I only started doing astrophotography in the last two years. And I have built an, an observatory out in the backyard. So uh, I've gone into this thing full stride and trying to make sense of it all. I got the uh, Pix Insight is the only thing I've really started to use. And when I first opened this thing and I saw all these uh, different processes, I had no idea what to do in what order. Uh, so one of the things I want to emphasize is you really need to work on your workflow, what you do in what order. And uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, YouTube videos on the Astro, Image, Astro Imaging channel. Uh, so uh, Chuck's Astrophotography, Astro Dude uh, have helped me. And uh, also I belong to Warren Keller's site, IP for AP. And he drills down into the uh, processes pretty good if you ever want to go to his website. So let me show you what I did first. I did the LRG combination. And of course, uh, when I did this, let me bring up the, the function. One of the things I want to mention is I did not use 100% channel weight in the blue channel. I went to 50%. And I'll explain why I did this a little bit later in the presentation. So everything else is 100% standard uh, settings, except for the 50%. Now, of course, we look at this, we see this overcast, and we want to get rid of that. So we use an automatic background extractor. And I just did a standard uh, subtraction. Normally, if it was a, a nebula or complex object, I would use the dynamic background extractor, but uh, we just have stars and background. So I found this to be sufficient in this case. And when I pulled out that background, I got all rid of all that nasty green that was hanging around there. So at this point, I wanted to get rid of some of this stuff that was in the original image. There was some uh, framing issues. You can see where there's a little bit of drift of the camera. Also, there's this dark pixel column off to the right here. I wanted to get rid of that. And then when I cleaned up the green, I started noticing small things in the background. I saw this galaxy here, but then I also saw this really, really small galaxy that's closer in. So I was wondering, what that was. So I, I went over to Astrobin, and of course you could get uh, these these uh, little identifiers that pop up. And I saw that this was uh, out here it was 6207 NGC 6207, which is a nice little galaxy. But then in here there's this also this tiny little galaxy IC 4617. So when we look at the distances of these things. Uh, M13 is 12,000 light years away. This one out here is uh, 46 million light years away. And this tiny one here is something like 487 million light years away. So the theme of my uh, crop or the theme of my image was near, far, and very, very far. So that's why I cropped it in the way I did. So to get my colors started, I used the uh, background neutralization and color calibration. I picked a little preview here in the background where I didn't see any stars. And I used that for my background neutralization. And for the white balance, I did a, a preview right here in the core of the globular. So that was my, my white uh, reference. You can see if you drop down color calibration, the preview is here and here. You hit that and that starts bringing your colors forward. And uh, I just want to mention right around this time, 
I'd like to do a stretch of the original image as we have it here. And what I like to do is get rid of the linear image and create a stretched image. And then when I do that, I start making my masks. I start making my masks early. And I got a luminance mask, which I trimmed off uh, a little bit with histogram transformation to get rid of the light areas in the back. So I have kind of like a black and white mask. I also got a range mask done so I could focus on just the core of the globular later. And I also created a star mask so I could do a little work on the size of those stars and try to reduce their, if they're bloated or anything else, I could reduce them later. So here's what I started to get. And I'm looking at this image and I'm thinking, oh, the colors are starting to come forward, but uh, I don't really like what I see yet. And uh, I was reading on uh, Cloudy Nights one time about uh, globular clusters. And somebody there told me that uh, you have to be careful with your colors and globulars. I guess the fashion trend is to have a lot of blue stars in the center of the image. Uh, but that's not technically correct. Uh, blue stars are new stars, like only a few million years old. And globular clusters are some of the oldest stars in the Milky Way. So they're billions and billions of years old. So there's not too many blue stars in there. There are a few called blue stragglers, which are caused by star collisions, but uh, apparently they're few and far between. So that was my reason for the initial uh, selection in the combination to cut down on the blue channel a little bit. I didn't want to have it too blue in the center of the globular. And I try to get a more natural or realistic type of color balance. And I'm not sure if you could uh, see that the colors are coming forward a little bit more. My stars are uh, kind of yellow a little bit. There's a slight blue tinge. Got a yellow star here. And a blue star here, but the blue stars are not uh, too overdone. Then I did a morphological transformation applying that earlier star mask. And I came up with these two images at the end. Uh, one, I thought the one on the left had too much of the blue. That's when I used a hundred percent of the, uh, the blue channel. And the one on the right, I cut it down to 50% and I was more satisfied with that the particular image. Uh, these aren't very large. So let me, let me see if I could jump to my final image. There you have it. And a little bit of blue tinge here in, in the globular cluster, but uh, not too much. Got lots of yellow stars. You can see this uh, nice galaxy here. And of course, the data was so good. So we've got this little tiny galaxy in here, which I never really noticed before in my own data. I probably would have passed that off for a star. But uh, there it is. And that uh, that is what I came up with as my final image. So uh, I'll leave it there. OK, thank you very much. Thank you to all our presenters, Linda, Ryan, Doug, Jan, uh, John. Oh, Michael, Mike, uh, John again, uh, different spelling, John. And uh, also Eric wasn't able to be here, but he did um, He did have his, um, uh, he, he did want everybody to know that he was able to make his image with very, very, very few, very little work by um, using the program he used. So go back and check out all the images that were out there and compare things. I got a couple of comments I can make um, and share a few things. Um, one of the things that I was surprised at is that um, everybody kind of, or not everybody, but most of the people kind of stuck with my original idea. My original idea was not a picture of M13, but a picture of M13 and its buddies way out there, that there was a lot more to see. And as a result, I knew I had to have a weird composition. Um, and oh, by the way, am I screen sharing?
Um, okay, let me let me get to back here. 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 Screen, screen share, share, screen. share screen. Boink, boink, share. Okay, and hide and hide that. Okay, so this this was pretty much my final image here eventually, and I wanted. I wanted that that galaxy and that little galaxy. I wanted them to show up, even if it made for an odd composition. Um, and what I was surprised at, Linda referred to it, and, and a couple other people referred to it, is that uh, you know, remember Adam Block's presentation? What was it? Two months ago? Three months ago? He was saying you got to tell a story. Well, the story that I wanted to tell here was that there is a lot of stuff out there. It isn't just that big glorious thing. OK, uh, while I've got this up, I should say that this over here, this one that says done. OK, that was the first time I finished it. And then after looking at what you guys did, I decided I need to darken the background. The, dark, the background is up too light. And so I made a full mask and um, uh, uh, made it so that it was just black and white this this was just black and white masked it and i just basically darkened everything that was already dark without affecting the lightness of everything else i was not at all bothered by the blue stars i think there are some blue stars in um in a lot of globular clusters and i think with a tolga you got something to say about that eventually i think or who was it that was where, where did i read that recently but at any rate um so, so yeah. yeah, that was my interpretation, and and I was out to make a pretty picture that told a story, and I wasn't quite as worried about the ultimate accuracy of it. So that's that's the one I first finished up with, the one that says done, and then I said done again, darker, and it's got more formal names where I've where I've saved it. One of the issues that came up in this um, in this uh, exercise, and you can see it pretty well here. Let me see. You, this is my luminance image when all was said and done. And you'll notice that the luminance image doesn't have the column problems that my, this is my red sample that I had. You notice this big old column sitting over here. I think there's another one someplace else. But at any rate, um, and I can tell you the reason that that happened. The, I used batch processing and told it to do some cosmetic correction. And I had defined over in cosmetic correction the bad columns um, that existed in a one by one binning. And so this is a one by one binning. Everything else was upsized to that. But the the screen, the, the definition of what my bad columns were, were established according to uh, this, not according to the two by two binning that came up. And so uh, when it was all resized and everything else like that, the, cosmetic correction never got rid of that that uh, line and that's what some of the uh, presenters were referring to as the bad columns so um the proper way to have done this would have been to <coughs> excuse me just a second <coughs> the proper way to have done this would have been to a batch process my um my color frames according to one set definition of um, a cosmetic correction and um, process my um, luminance frames according to another set of cosmetic correction def error definition and then have them all aligned to the um, uh, luminance um, the star alignment to the luminance and taking it from there and i never would have seen this column again so those are two things. Uh, just one other thing. Um, one of the presenters, who was it, Doug, I think, was referring to the fact that um, he had only had 1,960 millimeters of focal length. And so his, his um, picture was a, a little more um, uh, focused in. Actually, I've got 2450. The, the picture that you guys are looking at is looking at 2450 on a 12-inch RC. And uh, what I, the difference probably is, is I was using a full frame. So I did not crop out the um, the outer edges of my frame. So um, this, just for your 
your edification. This is a SX35 on a 12 inch, oh, that's a Starlight Express 35 millimeter. It's a full frame camera on a 35, um, on a uh, 12 inch RC. It's riding a um, Astrophysics 1200. SGP did all the work capturing it. Um, and it's a combination of 12 shots in each of the um, uh, approximately 12 shots in each of the um, uh, fil with each of the filters. Um, and I guess that's about that. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I needed to say for all that stuff. So let us go back to where we were. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Have we got any questions have come up? Yes. yes, a couple of people have mentioned thanks to the presenters. They've done a good job and that you have done a good job. You are, you are the people that make the Astro Imaging Channel work. I want to say uh, a few I things. I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have this question that always comes up from friends and family and other people. I try to explain this uh, hobby or pursuit to. They want to know, after I've explained everything about capturing Im images and processing, all the lengths I go, all the time I spend, they want to know how much money I'm making uh, doing this thing so <laughs> if anybody has a good answer to that please let me know <laughs> yeah um i would hate to think how much we spend per picture per finished picture on all this other stuff um what kind of friends do you have to care how much you know, <laughs> we all pass that by now Aren't we all in a post-economic world uh particularly after last week in the market um it, it would be good to be that way but um thank you all for presenting we're going to be coming back pretty soon with some more programs coming up in the near future and we will have another workshop eventually we have to figure out who's going to be doing it and all that other stuff uh tolga uh and um eric do we have anything else that we have to say to the folk uh no nothing over on youtube i'm all set okay um, um i'm clear on my end you're okay. You're okay. Um, um, last, last week, we had, we had a couple of, I think it was Diego, but I'm not sure on that anymore. He uh, He's looking for a guru. Uh, and a couple of other people asked specific questions in the comment section of YouTube, that, that, but not during the show. You're welcome to do that, okay? And we may, we may be able to get back to you. But I can tell you that a much better form for getting that kind of a, a question answered is to go to Cloudy Nights or ice and space if you're down that part of the world or wherever you are and um and tell them where you are tell them what you want to do there's got to be an astronomy club somewhere someplace near you that can probably do you a lot of good it's fun to be on youtube and fun to you know transmit uh, you know get, get on a hangout with you and take over your computer and show you things like that that's all very cool but it doesn't compare to being out on the site with somebody, working with somebody, getting an individual relationship with somebody that can help you do that kind of stuff. So um, we do want to help you on the Astro Imaging Channel. We'll continue to do shows like this for as long as we can. And we help you. We thank you for all our support. Some good news is that we have been incorporated in the state of California as a nonprofit. All that hasn't exactly all the paperwork hasn't been done yet but we're working on it we're adopting bylaws and stuff like that and the reason we're doing that is not so that we can be a nonprofit organization but that we can be a corporation that continues in a life of its own so that no matter which one of us gets tired or gets hit by a car we'll be able to continue the astro imaging channel the work of the astro imaging channel we do need some help doing this particularly with the loss of some of the software that we've been using for the for five years now. Um, it's gotten more difficult. Um, I, for instance, have to be at Sequoia next week at Sequoia National Park, it's their dark sky festival. I'm gonna be doing some presentations up there. And if you're in California or any place else nearby, come on over, we're gonna be doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and it'll be a lot of fun. But that means I won't be here for Sunday night which means that Tolga and Eric and if Terry's back and Molly, maybe they have to run the show by themselves. And it actually takes the bunch of us coordinated to kind of figure out how to do that. 
if you would like to help us do that kind of stuff, please identify yourself. Contact us. Contact at the astroimagingchannel.com. You'll find that on the website. Um, we need some gurus that can just sit there and, and kind of keep us all in line. Okay? Thank you all. I remind for everybody that's in, in the room, thank you so much for participating and making this workshop worthwhile. A lot of people commented that, hey, they learned a lot, and it's always fun to see how other people process the stuff. Um, and you can stay in the room here and discuss things. You can discuss life, the weather, and whatever you like. Unfortunately, we got to say goodbye to all the other people out there. So, Toga, I've said goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Um, we're going to be going off the air. Take us, Take away, us away, Toga. Good night, everybody. See you next week.